to start my story in a, a little village, a little city not far from here where I grew up, uh, roughly 40 years ago. I'm what you can call a child of the 80s. I grew up in a world that was dominated by what then was Generation X, a world that wasn't connected yet, a world that wasn't augmented yet, a world that didn't know the internet yet. But I'm also a kid of the 90s. I also grew up in a world that knew the internet, a world that became connected, a world where I felt intellectually together. I could share and I could use all the devices that we have today. But I want to start with the beginning. When I was 10 years old, I got my first computer. Now, it looked like this. And maybe some of you recognize this device. Hopefully, some do. Uh, this is a Commodore 64. Now, uh, between you and me, don't tell this to my dad. Please don't. But when I asked for this computer, my dad was going, listen, why do you want this computer? And I, and I of course, told him because I want to learn how to use and program a computer. The truth is, I wanted to play games, of course, but don't tell him that. Uh, the thing was that I quickly found out that for the Commodore 64, there were no games available. They didn't exist. Nobody had made them yet. There was no store to go to that I could actually go and buy a game. So I had to learn to build them myself. And this is how the screen of a Commodore 64 looks like. This was the first graphical user interface. And if you look closely, you see this little blue dot. That's actually the mouse pointer. That's what I worked with. And a Commodore 64 has 64 kilobits, kilobits of memory. Now, imagine how much is that? Any idea? Shall I tell you? 64 kilobits of memory is half a second of music on your mobile phone. You probably haven't even noticed it. In that 64 kilobits of memory, this computer could execute programs, and I could play with it, and I could use it, I could program it. So there it is, my first computer. And a little later, Steve Jobs made this very uh, remarkable comment. He said, what a computer is to me, uh, it's a bicycle for our minds. It was really impressive, and, and it was a little bit of magic what we could do with these very early computers. We could build programs, and we could make these computers do things that we came up with in our imagination. And if you don't believe that a computer really is a bicycle for your minds, then you should check out what Ted Prize winner uh, Sumatra Mitra did with it. Uh, he brought computers with this hole-in-the-wall project to India. He gave it to children in slums. And when he came back a couple of months later, they not only understood how to operate the computer, they actually told him in Hindu, sir, we need a better processor. We need a faster computer. We need a mouse. And most importantly, we need games, of course. That's amazing. And he has repeated that experiment all over the world getting these amazing results. So a computer really is a bicycle for our minds. But let's continue with my story. 10 years later, when I was studying at university, I was 20 years old, the world had changed already a little bit. There was this new thing that came along and that was invented a little bit earlier by Tim Berners-Lee. In 1990, we invented the internet. And when I was working at university, of course, I had a much bigger and better computer. It was about a thousand times faster than my Commodore 64. I could connect with people all over the world. And I couldn't just write software on my local computer and show it to my parents and my friends. No, I could actually show it to people all over the world, and I could engage with them and ask their feedback. And of course, in the beginning, I got a lot of very interesting feedback, which helped me to become a better developer later on. Um, so here, this is a map of the internet today. This is three billion connections, three billion devices, three billion people being connected. And a little while ago on a TED talk, uh, Tim Berners-Lee actually said, the web as I envisioned it, as the web as I wanted to be seen isn't there yet. The future is still much brighter than the past. 
Now imagine that we could connect 7 billion people and that they would have free and direct access to the internet. And that's what we started doing. We, we, a little bit later, we started not just writing software for our desktop computers, we started writing what we call web applications. This is what you all use today. But it was very exciting for us when the first web browsers came and when I could start writing software that I could share with people, I could install on the internet and people could use it and play with it without having any technical knowledge. So I met a couple of people online in 2005 that were as passionate about that as I was. And we started a little project. We said, like, hey, let, let's try to come up with something that allows people to easily build their own website. Wouldn't it be cool if everybody could do that? Um, so we created Joomla. And when I founded Joomla in 2005, together with 17 other co-founders, we did a little search on Google. And you can ask Google a lot of things that you just heard. Um, this was what Google had to say about Joomla. He had no clue. There were altogether four hits. Well, I did that same search yesterday, and this is the result. More than 120 million hits on the name Joomla. Today, Joomla takes about 3% of the internet. And we are not alone in that. There is other software out there that does the same thing. You might have heard of WordPress, and you might also have heard about Drupal, which is also co-founded and, and created by, by a Belgian, Dries Bathard. Together, all these three take 30% of the internet. 30% of the website of the internet run this, one of those three pieces of software today. Now, there is something special about them. They're open source software. Well, they're a little bit more than open source software because people always say, ah, this is open source. And it's true, it's open source, but not all open source software is created equal. So we are talking about what we call free and open source software. And the freedom here means free, the freedom to use, the freedom to study, the, fr the freedom to change, and the freedom to share. So it's not just free as in free beer, as some people sometimes say. Beer is also important in Belgium, no problem about that. It's important. But still, those freedoms are also important. Now, I see a couple of people in the front going like, what? Why are you spending three years of your life giving this software, building this software, and then you're giving it away for free? Are you out of your mind? Like, what doesn't compute up there? Why didn't you just commercialize it and sold it for a lot of money? See, and that's a very interesting question, a question that I struggle with for quite some time. Why don't I do that? And I didn't have a good answer to it until quite recently, actually. In the beginning, you know, we joked around. In, in the geek world, we often say, uh, if you want to have a geek, well, we consider my gal a little bit of a geek, if you want to have a geek, write good software, you give him free beer and free pizza, and everything will be good. And that's probably partly true. But there should be a little bit more to it. So a while ago, I was watching a TED Talk by uh, Daniel Pink about the puzzle of motivation. And in that talk, Daniel talks about the, uh, the maximizers of purpose. And I realized for myself that I wasn't just a guy that was pursuing his next paycheck, that was trying to maximize profit. I was somebody that was looking to maximize my purpose in the world. I was looking to master something, to be independent, to change things. And that made a lot of sense to me. And another reason that I think I do what I do is because, in a sense, I want to be part of building this world. I cannot control it, but I might be able to influence it a little bit. And that's what Douglas Ruskov writes about in his book, Program or Be Programmed. You have two choices. Either you can let people build the world for you, and then you're going to need to live into it, in it, and you're going to be programmed. Or you can try to influence it and help program it yourself. And I think the most important reason 
that I'm doing this is because I don't think we have a choice. I think that we are coming at a point in time that there is no choice anymore. Technology is evolving so fast. Technology evolution is exponential. There is more technology progress in the last 10 years than in the previous 100. My computer that I got when I was 10 was a very simple, simplistic computer. The computer that I got when I was 20 was a, a thousand times more powerful. The computer that I had 10 years later was a million times more powerful. We need to work together, we need to collaborate to be able to increase technology and change our world. And that is part of the movement that I'm in, the free software movement. We believe that software doesn't improve by having a million users or by having a million people talk about it. We believe that software improves by participating, by collaborating, and by contributing to it. And there are many people across the world that are doing this in their free time. Now, I have a question for you. Are you a pirate? Are you able to stand up and say, hey, I want to be part of this. I want to help make change happen. Because I see a lot of people around complaining about things that are going wrong, about how bad the world has become, how much problems that we have. And if you ask them, well, what are you prepared to do about it? Then they go like, well, maybe I should. But I haven't done it yet. But why haven't you done that yet? See, Douglas Ruskoff says, we are today creating a blueprint, a design for our collective future. And we cannot do it alone. We need to do it together. And then my next question for you is, if you say, hey, I want to be that pirate. I want to help. I want to be a hacker. I want to be a change maker. I want to be a troublemaker. Then my next question is, what future do you wish for? Have you thought about that? Is it the future made by Facebook, where we're all like bots? Maybe there's another future out there for us. And think about that. As designers and developers, we have an even more greater responsibility than ever before. That responsibility is directly proportional to the number of people that we affect with every product and service that we create. The more technology that we weave into our lives, and there is a lot more technology coming, the bigger the implications of our work will be. We need to think about that before we build it. Each meme, pattern, metaphor, and script and API that we developers create will become part of that collective future. We shape our tools, that's what we do today, but our tools also shape us. So my question again, there is no guarantee that if you put up your, your finger and say, hey, listen, I also want to be a pirate, that any work that you do will have impact, but there's a very likelihood that it will. So again, what future? Do you wish to create? Work is going to fill a large part of your life, and the only way to be truly satisfied is to love what you do. Time Magazine, I think, says single-handedly he created the industry. It was the magic. We could influence the world. Most places in life are continuously telling you that your dreams aren't possible or practical. Uh, what you want to do is race after them.
successful, unquote, in the eyes of society and the ones that didn't. Oftentimes, it, it's the ones that are successful love what they did so they could persevere. We believe that people with passion can change the world for better. That's what we believe. The minute that you understand that you can poke life, you can change it, you can mold it. Once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. Stay hungry, stay foolish. And I have always wished that for myself. And now, I wish that for you. Stay hungry, stay foolish. So I want to leave you with two wishes that I always had for myself. And I want to wish them for you too. This is things that I try to remind myself of every day. I don't try to live a base mundane life, just, just with the idea of living a happy life. I see it everywhere. The latest, newest hashtag is YOLO. You only live once, which is awesome. And you definitely need to make the best out of it. But you can also make the best out of it changing things. So what I try to do is I try to pursue things that are so important that even if I fail, and I have failed many times already, it's still better to having tried. That's my wish to you. Thank you.